House Aaron's presence in this prequel is fairly diluted, but it's there thanks to Ama Aaron, the character responsible for breaking everyone's brain in the season premiere of House of the Dragon. Even in Game of Thrones, the Aarons are kind of in the background because there isn't much of them left by this point in the story. When going through all this family's lore, you come to the conclusion that they just attract bad things. It's just tragedy after tragedy over the generations. And it doesn't start with Aima. Like where the show begins, let's take things back to the time of the old king, Jaehaerys. Because the Aarons and Targaryens didn't have much of a relationship before this point. They weren't close allies like the Baratheons or Valerians, nor were they bitter enemies like House Martell. The last king of the Vale, a little child, was just excited to see a dragon up close and begged his mom to go for a ride. So his mother bent the knee and they've been loyal vassals for the two generations leading up to the old king. But Roderick Aaron served the old king as his master of laws on his small council. Roderick Aaron, lord of the Eyrie and defender of the Vale, came to power at the age of 10. This happened 54 years after Aegon Targaryen's conquest of the Seven Kingdoms. He came into lordship at this very young age due to the deaths of his uncle, the previous lord, and his father, Sir Raymond, at the hands of some wildling raiders they were pursuing in the Vale's mountain range. The books say wildlings, but that doesn't necessarily mean savage raiders from beyond the wall. The Vale notoriously has to deal with some similarly primitive mountain clans, but aren't even afraid to take on some nobles. Early into the Old King's reign, a pandemic rocked their world, and there was no COVID vaccine to save them. Leeches are the best technology they got. Some members of court need to be replaced after their quick deaths, and a young Lord Roderick Aaron, who the king and queen once met, was selected to fill the seat of Master of Laws in 60 AC. Let me take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. I'm sure most of you have heard all about Nord by now, but for the ones in the back that haven't, NordVPN is a service that allows you to change the location of your IP address, which means companies and people can access all your data. Doing this protects your privacy, but you also notice a whole new catalog of shows and movies on Netflix when your IP address is in a new country. For those of you in some of the more conservative parts of the world, you probably know how vital VPNs are for you because of your government keeping you in blinders. Nord gives you a little taste of freedom so you can browse on sites we take for granted without sacrificing speed. That's what got me hooked on Nord. I've tried a lot of lesser VPNs out there over the years. Nord is the fastest and easiest to connect to a preferred part of the world out of the 5200 plus servers across 59 countries to select and switch to on a whim. So have companies like your own internet service providers snooping in on every step you take online and give yourself an extra layer of protection in case you're wandering off on harmful sites or downloading files with malware. Get your phones and computers or other devices set up with Nord by going to nordvpn.com slash whycreatevpn will get you an extra 4 months free with a 2 year plan. There's a 30 day money back guarantee just to flex how confident NordVPN is with their top tier product. The book Fire and Blood describes Roderick as erudite. Google tells me this means knowledgeable, but I've never heard this word before. So he lived in King's Landing, working away for his king for the next 20 years. And he must have been pretty damn good at his job, because this is the best reign in the story. This was a new realm, a lot of laws and regulations had to be implemented during Jaehaerys' long reign. Roderick gets thrown in the forefront of this world's history in 80 AC. The king's realm was thriving, but his own home was a little messy because of Jaehaerys and Queen Alicine's main children. One of their 13, Princess Daella, wasn't the most challenging of the bunch, just a little slow. It was hard not to love this simple and gentle character. She had no skill to give her purpose, and no interest in being married off to pump out dragon spawns. Jaehaerys, even more than Alcine, despaired of her. She will not even speak to a boy. How is she to marry? We could entrust her to the faith, but she does not know her prayers, and her septa says she cries when asked to read aloud from the seven-pointed star. The queen always rose to her defense. Daela is sweet and kind and gentle. She has such a tender heart. Give me time and I will find a lord to cherish her. Not every Targaryen needs to wield a sword and ride a dragon. Yeah, Princess Daela was one of the very few Targaryens to show no interest in dragons. Everything frightened her. So imagine how the bonding process or a flight on Dragonback would go for this little coward. At 13, Daela was sent to Driftmark to meet Coley's Valerion, the grandson of the Lord of Tides. Ten years her elder, the future sea snake was already a celebrated mariner and captain of ships. Dela became seasick crossing Blackwater Bay, however, and on her return, complained that he likes boats better than he likes me. She was not wrong in that. Dela's niece, Rainies, came along a little after to take the sea snake's hand in marriage instead, a much better match. So the search for a husband continued for the queen, who regularly had the job of being matchmaker. Her 16th name day was fast approaching, and with it, her womanhood. Queen Alysanne was at her wit's end and the king had lost his patience. 
On the first day of the 80th year since Aegon's conquest, he told the queen he wanted Daella wed before the year's end. If she wants, I can find a hundred men and line them up before her naked, and she can pick one she likes, he said. I would sooner she were a lord, but if she prefers a hedge knight, or a merchant, or Pate the pig boy, I am past the point of caring, so long as she picks someone. A hundred naked men would frighten her, Alicent said, unamused. A hundred naked ducks would frighten her, the king replied. And if she would not wed, the queen asked. Find her someone, someone gentle as she is, a kind man who will never raise his voice or his hand to her, who will speak to her sweetly and tell her she is precious and protect her against dragons and horses and bees and kittens and boys with boils and whatever else she fears. I shall do my best, your grace, Queen Alison promised. In the end, it did not require a hundred men, naked or clothed. The queen explained the king's commands to Diella gently but firmly, and offered her a choice of three suitors, each of whom was eager for her hand. The three men that Alcine had selected were great lords or the sons of great lords. Whichever men she married, Diella would have wealth and position. Bormund, Baratheon, Tymon Lannister, and last of the three, and least in many eyes, was Roderick Arryn, Lord of the Eyrie and Protector of the Vale, a familiar figure about court, and a leal friend to both king and queen. In the Vale, he had been an able lord, strong but just, affable, open-handed, loved by the small folk and his lord's bannermen alike. In addition, he had acquitted himself well in King's Landing. Sensible, knowledgeable, good-humored, he was regarded as a great asset to the council. Lord Aaron was the oldest of the three contenders, however, at 36. He was 20 years older than the princess, and a father besides, with four children left him by his late first wife. Short and balding, with a kettle belly, Aaron was not the man most maidens dream of, Queen Alcine admitted, but he is the sort you asked for, a kind and gentle man, and he says he has loved a little girl for years. I know he will protect her. To the astonishment of every woman at court, save mayhaps the queen, Queen Daella chose Lord Roderick to be her husband. He seems good and wise, like father, she told Queen Alcine, and he has four children. I'm to be their new mother. What her grace thought of that outburst is not recorded. Grand Maester Elisar's account of the days only says, Gods be good. Afterward, Lord Aaron took his princess back to the Eyrie. My children need to meet their new mother, and I want to show the veil to Diella. Life is slower there, and quieter. She will like that, I swear to you, your grace. She will be safe and happy. Lord Roderick, true to his word, was a kind man and caring husband who never failed to pamper and protect the bride he called my precious princess. Such letters as Daella sent to her mother, letters largely written for her by Lord Roderick's younger daughter, Amanda, spoke glowingly of how happy she was, how beautiful the veil, how much she loved her lord's sweet sons, how everyone in the Eyrie was so kind to her. After a year and a half of marriage, a different sort of message arrived at the Red Keep by Raven. It was very short and written in Daella's own uncertain hand. I am with child, it said. Mother, please come. I am frightened. Queen Halsein was frightened too when she read those words. She mounted her dragon Silverwing within days and flew swiftly to the Vale. Ama Erin, the daughter of Lord Roderick and Princess Daela, came into the world a fortnight early after a long and troubled labor. This was one of the sad house errand moments to read through. Childbed fever set in soon after birth, but Princess Daela desperately wished to nurse her child. She had no milk, and a wet nurse was sent for her. As her fever rose, the maester decreed that she might not even hold her babe, which set the princess weeping. She wept until she fell asleep, but in her sleep she kicked wildly, and tossed and turned, her fever rising ever higher. By morning, she was gone. She was eighteen years of age. Lord Roderick wept and begged the queen's permission to bury his precious princess in the veil, but Alicine refused. She was the blood of the dragon. She will be burned and her ashes interred on Dragonstone. So many of the old king and good queen's children died before them. That's why their grandson, Viserys, was chosen as heir to the Iron Throne. In 93 AC, a wedding took place with Prince Balon's eldest son, Viserys, to Lady Ama of House Arryn, the 11-year-old child of the late Princess Daella. Their marriage was not consummated until the bride had flowered two years later. So Roderick only had Ama with him in the Vale for a very short time, before she was shipped off to King's Landing to be around the others, the blood of the dragon. And Ama was very Targaryen-looking. You can't even tell that she has the surname of Arryn. It's so funny how close other great houses get to having their own dragon rider with Targaryen blood, then things take another turn. The Aaron line doesn't carry a drop of Targaryen blood. It continues through Roderick Aaron's son with his first wife. Unlikely the Targaryens would even allow an Aaron with Targaryen blood to even get a dragon egg, however. The eggs were their property and were very protective of them. Even in King's Landing with Viserys, Emma didn't get her own dragon. 
House of the Dragon gives us more characterization on Aemon Arryn in that one and only episode she appears in than all of the lore. But we still don't know why she didn't bond with the dragon, or maybe wasn't allowed to. A dragon rider belonging to another house is always seen as a threat. But Aima is more Targaryen than Arryn, despite her name. She is married to her first cousin after all. Lady Aima had suffered several miscarriages and the death of one son in the cradle over the course of their marriage. Some maesters felt she had been married and bedded too young, but she had also given birth to a healthy daughter, Rhaenyra, born in 97 AC. The new king and his queen both doted on the girl, their only living child. In 105 AC, Aima gave birth one last time to a son named Balon after King Viserys' father. Aima didn't survive the childbirth, and Balon followed her into the afterlife the next day. That's what the book tells us. The show took a darker route. Viserys ordered a horrific c-section against Aima's wishes that killed her, and a last-ditch effort for Balon to make out alive, but he still didn't. We don't see Roderick's reaction to his daughter's death, because he's also very dead. So dead that his granddaughter is the one ruling the Vale by this point in the story. A lot happened behind the scenes that we kind of have to piece together over these 20 years. Lady Jane Arryn has been in power since 97 AC, the same year Rhaenyra was born. And Jane was only three when the Eyrie passed down to her. Not sure why she's in charge when she has some male cousins, but like Rhaenyra, some exceptions must have been made by a more liberal predecessor. We do know that her father and older brothers were killed by mountain clansmen. We've heard this before. Her father, the previous Lord Aaron, was probably Roderick's son, going by the timeline. Jane being Roderick's granddaughter and Aemon's niece is the family tree I'm going with, since we're not given one. Things must have not gone well for Roderick after his gentle princess Daela died, and Aima taken from him. All that grieving makes for an early grave. Would be nice to see a friendship between the two granddaughters, Jane and Rhaenyra, in House of the Dragon. Rhaenyra is confident in the Aaron supporting the Blacks because of that blood tie. But we'll see how the negotiations go with Jaceres in the second season. They can't win her over with marriage because she's described as preferring the company of women and just so happens to not want a husband. But you can't just come out as a lesbian in this world, even if you're the one in charge. And that's the errands of this era. Thanks for watching, guys.